Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming on board Red Dot Dialogues. Today, we are talking about free and fair elections, and we want to know what's the PAP's true mandate. Um, firstly, let me apologize for starting this, uh, uh, this webinar slightly late. We are having some technical difficulties. We are thankful to TOC and Mr. Terry Su for helping us overcome this technical difficulty, right? So uh, my name is Ravi Philamon. I'm the Secretary, Secretary General of uh, Red Dot United. Joining me in the panel are, not, uh, are, are people who are familiar with many of us uh, here in Singapore. Uh, we have Dr. Chong Jayen, the Associate Professor of Political Science, Ms. Brema Mati, the Secretary of uh, Marua, Ms. Jeanette Chong Aroldos, a lawyer, uh, uh, Mr. Terry Su, the chief editor of the Online Citizen, and Mr. Howard Lee, a PhD candidate from Murdoch University. Right. So, since I have done the formal uh, introductions, uh, let me share a little bit about RDU's position on free and fair elections. Uh, what are our positions, what are our findings and experiences from GE 2020? Uh, when GE 2020 um, came about in July, RD was barely two weeks old. So um, we managed to put together a team of five people to contest in Jurong GRC. Um, I think considering that we were just a two weeks old party when the GG came around, we did considerably well. Uh, we did take out some positions on free and fair elections in the lead up to the last GE. Before the GE was called, we asked for fair access to the electorate in the last general election. We asked uh, for the official campaigning days um, to be extended and also for more access to mainstream media like TV channels, newspapers, and radio. Um, we also requested uh, to, have, to be able to hold town hall meetings in void decks, um, in food outlets, and other common areas. We, we felt that all these are important so that voters are familiar with the various platforms, policies, points, and counterpoints, and you always have a heightened awareness during the election period uh, where the voters will be able to compare and uh, contrast the different positions on different issues and cast their votes um, accordingly. So we felt that this was, this was very important for us to have. Um, of course, we were given uh, some time in the uh, television with the community broadcast, which was made available to all candidates, because this was a very special election, a COVID-19 election. But we felt that that alone was not enough. Right? And after the election, um, Mr. Darman, uh, who we contested against in Jurong, him and his team, right? he made some comments. Um, almost immediately after the election, he said, Free and fair elections um, is a. Uh, uh, we feel that free and fair elections is a precursor to evo to the evolution of Singapore politics. And soon after the last election, Mr. Darman shared his thoughts on the results of G twenty twenty and said that he has three ideal wishes for the evolution of Singapore's politics. Number one, it must be a democracy with a strong center, even as politics gets more contested avoiding the polarized politics that many other democracies have drifted into. Number two, it must be a democracy that keeps working to promote multiculturalism, multiracialism in society. Number three, it must be a more tolerant democracy with greater space for divergent views and a more active civil society without the public discourse becoming divisive or unsettling the majority. Of course, all this is contingent that free and fair elections is, is a precursor to, evolution, to the evolution of Singapore politics. And free and fair elections are the precursor to these ideals being fulfilled. So we felt that there are structural flaws 
which prevent our elections from being free and fair. The elections department, for example, is under the prime minister's office, which exercises broad powers over the entire electoral process. And the department lacks an effective oversight. And of course, there is the GRC system and the short campaigning period. We only have nine days of campaigning period. Even in the COVID-19 period, we only had nine days of campaigning period. And the gerrymandering of constituencies before every election, it stacks the odds against the alternative parties. Durang is an example, uh, has been gerrymandered several times since it was first constituted in 2001. Um, when Mr. Darman was fielded for the very first time as a rookie PAP candidate there, um, he went up against uh, Dr. Chi Sun Juan uh, uh, in, in the 2001 election. Uh, the, G the GRC remained intact after that election and uh, until 2011 when Bukit Batok was added to it. But when it did not do so well in G2011, uh, Bukit Bato was cut out of it as an SMC and Clementi was added to Jurong GRC. I mean, I, I'm not sure why Clementi or Bukit Bato is even in Jurong GRC, right? Um, and we are still not sure how will Jurong GRC change now that the opposition has made some inroads in Jurong and in Bukit Bato in the last election. Our own experience. Well, we all know how Ivan Lim withdrew from the con from contesting as a candidate in Jerome GRC soon before the last GE. Um, it is still a puzzle to many why Mr. Taraman chose to showcase him in his victory speech after the results were announced. But that is another story for another day, right? So to me, the results in the various divisions within Jerome GRC showed how unknown and even unpopular candidates can ride on the coattails of popular ministers into parliament. For example, in some polling stations in Bukit Bato and Clementi, we were scoring between 35 and 39 percent. And the nearer it got to Taman Jurong, I know during the election period, I said that Taman is immortalized in Taman Jurong. It was a joke. Right. But as it got closer to Taman Jurong, the results kept dipping. And in some polling stations in Taman Jurong, we were getting numbers like 15%, 18%, etc. Right? Would we have won the last election if not for the Taman factor? We were a two weeks old party when G2020 was called. It would have been an uphill battle. But this was made worse by the structure of our electoral system. And soon after the last election, we conducted a survey uh, among, uh, our, uh, among our families and friends and, uh, uh, and well-wishers, uh, a survey on free and fair election. I'm not sure if I, if I can share the screen. Uh, let me try if I can. Um, You see it? Can, hope you can see it. Um, okay. Our survey showed that uh, um, only 15% when asked, do you feel that elections in Singapore are free and fair? Of the 145 responses that we got, only 15% said yes, definitely. Whereas 24% said no, not at all. Uh, the rest were in between these two responses. I know it's not representative um, and it's a, a survey with our own well wishes, but I think this is generally how many Singaporeans feel on the topic. And it's, it may be quite reflective of uh, how many Singaporeans see it. We asked another question. Um, is it important to you that elections in Singapore be free and fair? Where almost every participant said that it was important for them that, that our elections were free and 
Okay. We, we also ask a question, the third question being, do you feel that your vote is secret? Um, a minority feel that their vote is not secret, about 15.9%. But there is also a fairly large number of people who said that they did not know, right? So only 54.5% of, uh, of respondents said that they know that their vote is secret. I know that, uh, I mean, having participated in two elections, I know for a fact that, uh, our, that, the, election, that the votes that we cast at an election, it is secret. Um, and uh, uh, I think even Mr. Lee Kuan Yew uh, said, right, in, uh, in one of the forums that he participated in, what are you afraid of? Your, your votes are secret. You know, I'm sure organizations like uh, Marua and other civil society organization um, have to, uh, other civil society have emphasized before every election that the, that the election, that the, that the votes are secret, right? So despite that, um, despite this, many, many feel that the votes, that the vote is not secret. So I think the work is cut out for organizations like POC, and um, uh, and Marua to keep on educating the, the people that their vote is secret, right? So uh, that's all I want to say uh, with regards to the RDU's positions, findings, and our experience of contesting in the in the last uh, election. And uh, uh, who we have next on our list is uh, Dr. Chong Jayen. Um, yes, Ian, over to you. All right. Um, thank, thank you uh, very much, Ravi. Uh, so before I begin, uh, let me say that um, I'm uh, participating in my own personal capacity. I do not represent um, my employer, uh, the Ministry of Education, or anybody else. Uh, the remarks are completely my own. Uh, and also, uh, my appearance here is uh, not uh, an endorsement or a criticism of uh, any particular political party and should not be, be uh, misconstrued um, as, uh, as anything else. Okay, so especially for the um, people from the media, uh, the participants and others, uh, please uh, do take note of this. All right, thank you. It's something I, I uh, want to say uh, up front. Um, and I, I guess the reason why I'm participating is because I think it is a um, it's it's a civic responsibility to be able to and quite an honor to be able to offer uh, some considerations about how our political system works uh, to uh, Singaporeans and, and others who are interested uh, because I think uh, that's one way to help. Um, uh, facilitate a more active uh, citizen citizenry, right? So uh, to the extent that people know how a system works uh, and are able to sort of exercise their options more, uh, that's the sort of spirit of uh, participation uh, for me. Okay, so let me briefly talk about um, our electoral system in Singapore. Uh, we have uh, largely what's a first past the post system, meaning to say um, for for uh, parties who are contesting, as long as they get most of the votes, uh, I would, it's not necessarily a majority in, in um, multi corner race, races, the party that wins the plurality, um, you can say more than all the others uh, uh, can win as well, right? So it's not strictly a majoritarian system. Um, and there, and uh, it's based around, um, it's based around uh, single member constituencies and also currently four member uh, group representative uh, constituencies and five member uh, GRCs. In addition to that, um, we also have this um, uh, nominated member of parliament system, uh, sorry, uh, non-constituency member of parliament system and a nominated member of parliament system, meaning to say that um, we have 93 contested seats. Um, should there be uh, not up to 12 uh, members um, Parliament from uh, a party that is other than the ruling party uh, mechanism will be triggered uh, such that they will the best losers will make up those numbers. So um, any any way you cut it, uh, the system is supposed to guarantee 
uh, 12 uh, non-constituency members of parliament. And then there are also the nine nominated members of parliament who are not elected, but nominated and then selected by the committee of selection in parliament, right? And these uh, individuals are supposed to be non-partisan. Okay, so that's generally the sort of picture of, of our, electorals, uh, our electoral and parliamentary system. Uh, there are several alternatives if you think about voting. So in this conversation about uh, what's a better um, electoral system, there's often right uh, things that are commonly thrown out there, uh, um, uh, proportional representation systems. So there are several kinds of this is party list. So it means to say that a, a section of the um, parliamentarians, the legislators are set aside and uh, people will vote uh, for the party and, and then seats are allotted uh, to, to the party based on the proportion that they get. Uh, and then it will run down the, the list of uh, candidates that the party has, right? That's uh, a party list. There's a single transferable vote system, meaning to say that uh, voters will, um, will have a rank ordered list of candidates. So as the top ranked people get eliminated, their vote will transfer to, to the next person on that list until somebody gets, uh, gets uh, elected, right? Um, and so there's a mixed member proportional representation system, which is actually quite common. Um, so very few um, legislatures, I think, are completely proportional representation. What they have is a mix of uh, districts that are elected directly and then uh, other seats that are uh, elected off of a party list, for instance, right? Um, so the, these, um, different systems, essentially what the principle behind them are is how to get better and more accurate representation of the electorate. Because um, like in many societies, um, Singapore is highly plural, highly diverse, and there are different ways of approaching this, this question, right? So how do you capture that plurality such that uh, people of different positions get representation? It's not just a majoritarian, majority rules, um, kind of a system where you can lean too, too easily towards uh, tyranny of the majority. Um, the point of having uh, proportional representation, right, is to ensure that you have other voices raise their concerns to deliberate um, in, uh, in parliament and also very importantly to exercise oversight, right, of the, of the party that is in office, right? So, so the way that we do it in Singapore is uh, th through this NCMP plus uh, NMP system. Uh, and I think one of the things that we should think about is you know, how this uh, serves our purposes um, and the, the space possibly for, for improving or not. Okay, uh, now there are a couple of other things that um, we, we want to uh, think about is uh, in the election process itself, we have essentially a one person vote system. Um, and then there's a very short campaign period as, uh, as Rafi uh, had mentioned. Now, um, these are sort of features. The, what's important to think about are the implications. What do, what do these features do? Um, so on the one hand, I think uh, what everybody is quite familiar with is the GRC system is supposed to ensure uh, representation by people from Singapore's um, uh, ethnic minority groups. Right. Um, of course, this opens up the question of um, well, uh, you know, as the population changes, as a demographic changes. For instance, I think about um, a third of uh, Singaporean marriages are with non-Singapore citizens. Uh, about a fifth uh, are mixed race marriages. So that means to say that the uh, old uh, Chinese, Malay, Indian, other system on which the GRC system is based, right, uh, will come under increasing stress as our population changes. Um, so the degree to which the GRC system is able to represent minorities, I think, is something uh, that will increasingly uh, be uh, up for people to think about. Now, um, uh, of course, there are other ways, right, to do this, too, which is to have you know, um, uh, reserve uh, reserve seats for ethnic uh, minorities, so on and so forth. But anyways, uh, that's that's sort of one metric to think about. Another uh, is with the GRC system, uh, it tends to advantage political parties with more resources, meaning to say uh, parties that have more people uh, and also more money. Money because uh, elections in Singapore are not that easy, are not that cheap, right? You have to put up your, your deposit and the bigger the GRC is, the more deposit you have to put up. Now, um, then the other, uh, and also to actually run the campaign to put up posters and all this, it all costs money. Uh, and we don't have a system where uh, the campaign is state funded, right? So it, it can get quite expensive. The bigger the GRC is, 
the, the bigger the financial uh, requirement. Now, uh, people is important because sometimes uh, it's not just the money. If you have a lot of people who volunteer for you, um, that tends to uh, help. It helps you sort of uh, do a lot of logistic stuff, helps you do a a lot of outreach stuff, um, a lot of back end stuff too. I think, um, especially for for this past election, we've seen um, some of the very slick uh, social media uh, posts and, um, and 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 some of the outreach efforts by by some political parties. Um, and I mean, people can volunteer to do this, but it means that you need a skill base, right? Um, and so I think also it's almost not a surprise then that the parties with the uh, most resources uh, tended to do better, as we've seen in this election. Clearly, the PAP, but also the WP, um, the uh, the SDP, and, and the PSP. <clears throat> and PSP being quite new, but they do have people who um, I think have been around quite quite a while and have some experience and are able to sort of garner in um, uh, various kinds of support. Right. So it certainly translates uh, into the votes. Now. Um, there, there are certain uh, other issues too. Uh, so with the um, GRC system that we have, uh, one of these things that actually, it, it's helpful when there is uh, dominance of one or two parties, right? So uh, in that case, the, the GRCs are qu quite evenly contested. Um, but the issue is then if um, the political, the partisan scene uh, is more pluralistic, um, then what you can get, right, is a situation where the GRCs themselves would lend, the GRCs would lend themselves to um, relatively easy uh, changeovers in government because basically you're thinking of, you know, entire, uh, you know, basic four or five uh, seats tied to a, a single constituency. So uh, looking at the electoral department's uh, most recent report, for instance, um, the minimum percentage of uh, votes required to have a simple majority in parliament. That is, um, if we're looking at 93 seats, it's, um, it's, it's 42 for a simple majority. So it's at the very minimum, if we have, um, you know, 50% plus one vote in the, uh, uh, in the, all the small, in the smallest four, uh, five member GRCs and all the uh, four member GRCs and three SMCs, essentially uh, something like 24.4% of the electorate can uh, elect the majority in parliament. So this, of course, becomes an issue of representation. Um, and that's an inherent risk that is built into the, the, the way that uh, our GRC system works. Uh, and uh, going forward, I suppose it's, it's, to, uh, it's useful to think about um, how far or whether sort of uh, adjustments need to be made uh, on that front, right? Um, and also we can lower that number to um, that percentage, right? If we're just thinking about a plurality, a party can get the most uh, number of seats, right? So they would be in an advantage position to form uh, the next uh, administration, uh, possibly in coalition, but they get uh, as the largest, uh, uh, as the winner of the largest number of seats, uh, they essentially get first dibs, right? So you, you, you get a situation where um, even below the 24.4% uh, 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 vote share uh, situation, you can get a party that um, is able to form the next uh, the, the next administration. So so these are sort of inherent um, tensions in, in our system. Um, one of the things then uh, that the uh, that our GRC and our core system does not do, I mean, doesn't stop um, doesn't stop strategic voting. So uh, voters may uh, you know cast their votes uh, because they want to send certain messages. Sometimes uh, it is send a protest message. Sometimes it's because they do prefer more oversight and they are discerning among the parties that they believe uh, can perform this oversight function. So one of the explanations that's been thrown around about why you see the, uh, the WP and the uh, uh, PSP doing better is because uh, in the eyes of voters, they believe that um, these parties are more able to exercise a uh, oversight function uh, in parliament. Um, sorry, I you, but I mean, that's just the, the numbers of speaking. Uh, and so um, on, on, on that, I would, on that note, I would uh, also uh, finish off here by sort of uh, suggesting that, um, you know, all this stuff about oversight and consideration, what kind of interest to get represented. Um, sometimes in Singapore, we very often fall into this um, narrative of saying, oh, they're opposition voters and then they're PAP voters. Um, I think it's really hard to pigeonhole people that way. Um, people are fairly complex, right? And they 
vote on different vote for different reasons and they and they're motivated to to you know prioritize different things under different conditions right so this this is how you explain the swing in vote share between say G2011, uh, G2015, and G2020. So uh, in that re regard, right, to say that oh, there, are, there are opposition or PAP um, uh, voters, I think underplays the fact that uh, Singaporeans do uh, are discerning uh, and they do think about uh, who they vote for. Sure, emotions um, may play a role, but that's not that's nothing nothing particularly wrong about it uh, as long as they're, they're fairly considered. Because after all, as humans, right, we have sort of the rational calculating side, but that's not all of who we are. There are other kinds of things that appeal to us. Okay, sorry, I've been uh, going on a little bit too long. Uh, let me end there um, and uh, hand it off to the next person. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ian. Appreciate that. Um, next on our list is uh, Brema. Brema is my friend for a very long time. Uh, we uh, we worked together in Marua. I have since left, but uh, yeah. So uh, she is the secretary of Marua. Brema, over to you. Can you all hear me, please? Can you? Can you all hear me, please? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just trying to, sorry, just give me a moment to organize my slides. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ray Dot, for uh, bringing us uh, on board in this, I think, important discussion. And I think for Marua, we, um, um, back to the topic on three and Sorry, I, um, I, I thought I was the third speaker. That's why uh, my apologies, sir. Just give me one moment to get the act together a little bit. So uh, based on what how e, uh, Dr. Ian Chong has opened the discussion, I think there are uh, the, on electoral systems, I think it's very good. He has raised some pointers that I would like to perhaps add on uh, my own little two bits. So in this discussion, I would share first the importance of a campaign. Marua, from 2011 onwards, we have always run a campaign regularly to reassure citizens. This is the last one that we did for GE 2020. I've just put it up to show what were all the different posters that we put up from time to time. But I want to emphasize why is the camp the, these these posters, some of them are like, you know, so much understood and why do we still have to do it? We have to reassure the citizen that A, the vote is secret, but more importantly now, I think there's a slight shift. We are builders of our future and therefore your vote is vital. So conceptualizing the, the approach to citizens, I think that will have to be the role of all of us, civil society, and a lot of people who are coming onto the media, social media, etc. The second thing I would like to say is that Marua, uh, for the 2011, we conducted a huge camp, uh, survey, we analyzed the news reports, etc., which I hope Howard or Jerry will add on. But I think at the end of the day, at that time, we talked about the changes that are needed to the media laws, the restrictions, et cetera, and the coverage. Coverage has improved somewhat, but still not to a good desired and open level. There are more actors today in the 2020, I was observing how we have a plethora of different actors. There were many pre-election forums that took place. I attended quite a number, one of the ones by that, uh, Dr. Patina Law, if I get the name wrong, my apologies, uh, from Canada, I think she has done quite a lot of statistical analysis. And I think those are interesting that we all have to engage more on to understand trends that are developing. And, and I think that ties up with what um, Ian had shared about how even a small percentage of voters can shift the power balance and the dominance of who can become the government in a short um, in a in a short uh, campaign period of an election. 
the other thing that uh, Marwa has always been uh, asking about is structural reforms. We, we believe that it is time to have some structural reforms, which I will expand later, and therefore it is tied up with legislative amendments or even certain laws that maybe do we, to what extent do they, are they of service? and the electoral system and what's the house? Ian has touched upon it. What is the house supposed to comprise uh, the parliamentary system itself? So I will go to that and, and the outline of my discussion is up there and I will just plunge into it. Otherwise it's going to take time, but I just want to highlight this point about the many stakeholders. We have had a new narrative coming on very strongly with a lot of articles and opinion pieces on their website, online citizen, the Terry, there's Howard, there's Ravi Philemon, Kumaran, a whole group of people have been keeping online citizen going, which was, I think, perhaps an offshoot or by itself from yawning bread. What, why I'm highlighting is that these are important alternative media sites, which I think we have to protect uh, as they are offering us a lot of valuable information. Knowledge management 2020, I think this is one of our challenge. A lot of people are very active in the media scene using whatever forms. How is knowledge being managed? What is the information flow and the instancy of this information that comes? A social, uh, what? A safety ambassador says something almost within an instant, it is up on Facebook. Then begins the tirade, the compliments all about this person. So a single person risks this huge plethora of uh, views coming at the person. I, I think it is it can be detrimental to the whole process if at the citizenry level, the whole point about what uh, Mr. Thar Minister Tharman said and Ravi, you brought it up again. If we are not careful in our own maturity and growth patterns and evolution to, to getting more and more engaged, how to take a step back from really getting uh, tyrannical in our views about individuals who are acting responsibly on the ground. Um, so that is what I just wanted to say on that. So why is free and fair election so important under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 21. It is this keyword that I've highlighted in red. The will of the people is the basis of the authority of the government. Power lies with us to give the authority to the government that we want to be in power. We have not ratified the International Co Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It is also there very clearly. I have highlighted in red and you can see it for yourself. And in the UN Human Rights Committee's General Comment 25, very clear, the principle, this I think is crucial, principle of one person one vote. What is missing though in the Singapore context, one person, one vote, few candidates come in. That part is missing in this general comment of 25. So in our context, the representation, the representational approach to, call, to, to forming the government, one person, one vote, one candidate, we are having uh, a crux there that uh, is part of our structural reforms that Marua has talked about for from 20, from when, when we started all this. So details, there are certain things are in, there are improvements, alien terms. I'm calling all of these alien terms. So all these like things like GRC, representational politics and all that. People are, it's becoming more household, more street bound, which is good. People are engaging. However, it is still sporadic and not focused. Our approach to systemic destructuring and, on, and deconstruction, we, we, we are not seeing some of us the whole picture. So a bit of biting here and there. Dialogues with the state, very much absent. Marwa has written many times to the ELD asking for, can we talk about the research papers? Of course, there's no comeback. 
dialogues among stakeholders getting better, dialogues among political parties still arbitrary, and I think 2020 showed that again, but all these are crucial because it is a means and ways to develop greater democracy and build up greater free and fair elections. In particular, on the last point, I think it was wonderful that Red Dot Unite, uh, Red Dot United stood in um, in a in a place where they know they are just giving each voter the chance to think and to choose. I think that's wonderful. And also SDA that they decided on their own that they're not going to go everywhere. They're going to stay focused in passeries and that's it. And, and some other political parties decided they are dropping out of the scene. I think all these, um, without adding any value judgment, I think are, are quite well thought through uh, decisions. So the first paper that we did was to improve citizen uh, confidence. As Ravi has talked about in their survey that they did, this is uh, between nine to 14%. IPS did a survey and we followed up. It is still around there, the voter fear. We didn't do anything on this point for 2020 because I don't feel it is that restrictive today. Uh, serial numbers in our paper, we said, why do we really need the serial numbers? Although that we haven't had any incident of a fraud. So why don't we replace the serial number with a watermark like our dollar notes why can that be the way they are pressing voting the way that the, you have to put your vote into a particular ballot box that comes from a certain precinct it has given people the impression how did you know that my precinct had voted this way or that and then the lines are redrawn when it comes to electoral boundaries so we have say changed the precinct approach in 2013 huh? Polling booths offer more privacy. We have this great V. Many countries even have a square box for people to go in and do their cross. Roll call procedure, we have said stop the audible shouting aloud of who is the registrant who's coming in. So that was the that paper that we um, shared at that time. The next paper I would like to talk about is the electoral boundaries. The second one, this is 2011, 20, oops, 2020, and we have, sorry, sorry, the above 2015, and over here we have 2020. It's a pity the 2020 colors all from, uh, I think that's from Straits Times, it's a little bit muted, but I, I, I think the color contrast will tell us how electoral boundaries have been drawn over the years. We only, I only started with 2011 because that's when we started doing the research. So what does our second paper show that came out in 2014? Some of it, uh, I think both Ravi and Ian have already talked about it under Section 8 of the Parliamentary Elections Act. I've highlighted in red, where does the power lie? The power lies with the minister who can specify the names and boundaries of the electoral division. So it's very dominant only with, within one person who then talks to the cabinet to get approval. The history is over there. I'm not going to go through to say time 1968 electoral boundaries delimitation committee that's when smc cr trc started the birthing uh, the birthing 1984 this is important parliamentary membership act so that we have on the number of mps left with, within the government 1988 started the GRC and what are the issues with all of this lack of transparency sorry lack of transparency administrative boundaries we are just told okay here you are these are your constituencies these are the divisions that we are in a highly then we are living highly dense, huh? the population. So how then a point that Ian o has brought up, the equality in constituents per MP and representation by that. And lack of independence, lack of public consultations in all of this, we have, um, we have recommended that the constituency, um, the election boundary relies a lot or draws a lot, or the pivotal point comes from the urban renewal, not re planning, urban redevelopment authorities, planning entity. That, because that is used 
for how you house your schools, your clinics, your hospitals, etc. That should become the thesis on which we form our electoral boundaries. And we have also said impartial elections board review committee. Somebody on the chat has already made this suggestion. And we have said members who are experts in a lot of different, different expertise and the chairperson of the, sorry, excuse chairman, the, oh, that was terrible, pitiable on our part, chairperson of the elections board review committee should should be added to the public office under the constitution so it's a proper role that we give that person and not really an appointee where the roles are all spelt up and what is the role of the court that was our second paper the third paper was about the GRC. I will touch on it lightly because to save time and Ian has also spoken about it, but what is more important is the growth of the GRC. It soon became larger and larger GRCs. And at the same time, no by-elections. In the paper where I've given all the uh, the links in green, in the paper we have a little box that says who were all the MPs, some of them who passed away. And yet, because the person is in a GRC, there's no by-election and other MPs are told to, to double up, to help out with the constituent uh, constituency work, as well as with the constituents and untested candidates. Uh, the free ride here comes from a quote unquote that I didn't put it here, but it's in the paper that, um, uh, uncontested candidates come in, although they have done a lot of grassroots work. We take a chance because one vote is bringing in quite a number of candidates to becoming elected MPs. So whereas an SMC is, you know, you know better, you can gauge better the worth of the person. History of minority representation. In Singapore's history, we always had minorities without all the GRC. Yeah? That is the point that I want to highlight here and um in 2020 the the government has said we don't need it to put in an indian in, in the grc which raises this question then what's the purpose of a grc well, unless they have already done the sums and they have decided that there are enough indians or enough malays right so what are we saying about all of this? Uh, sorry, along the way, along the way, uh, former Prime Minister Go Chok Tong started introduce, uh, expanding the role of uh, putting within the GRC the context of the CDCs and the town council. And he has said, evolving more powers to MPs in town council, CDCs, and enlarging the maximum size of the GRC. And he has said it's actually electorally neutral. However, we feel that, uh, and the and the and and we feel is this really the way to go when it comes to uh, building up in our citizens an anti-discrimination approach, an equality approach, yeah? and uh, therefore our suggestion. Uh, something that uh, also Ian has said, but we have called it this ethnic balancing contingency system. It's in the paper to balance out and you can do it by candidature, you can do it by constituency, etc. Or and each has its pluses and each has its minuses, but we feel the GRC really to us is not part, it should not be part of our electoral system in the way we, we vote our uh, uh, is in the last I think this is the last paper uh, it's about the community development councils and the local government definition of local government is pitched into the community development councils which then comes with a plus the people's association which comes with another plus grassroots organizations and um, all that is the history but what is important is who comes under the CDC citizen consultative committees residence committees community centers, town councils, and along the way over the years, uh, more and more of, um, 
hang on yeah and along the way more and more of it is that it takes place to the exclusion of elected opposition mps the key operational word here is elected um, the classic example in the paper is the demolition of the resident funded senate estate community center in potong pasir in 1984 to be replaced by a pa control cc uh, to be run by the mp of potong pasir what else pa has taken on along the way more roles more activities event management in the social cohesion approach into art sports social activities practically everything but look at the budget we only did a budget analysis at that time 208 to 2013 291 to 424 they increase but what is also interesting is the operational cost of the cdc and the people's association which is in the second rate uh, tax. The other part, sorry, the other part, uh, I really must not keep playing with this uh, Mac on the, the keypad. And the other part of this is the non-electability of the CDC head. MP uh, mayors are selected and appointed to the role. And yet, under the ICCPR, it is very clear that every citizen must have a right to a freely chosen representative, even at the community level, which then goes to the first point, and which also goes back to what Ian has raised, the structure of the house. Where do we put mayors? Is it an open system, first past the, the first past the post system or should we be going into two forms of parliamentary system which i think is a long road and there's a lot of uh, prop, prop, uh, there will be a lot of resistance it has been talked about etc and we have put in magenta color are all the uh, suggestions and recommendations dissolve the existing cdc's it's five cdc's and five mayors replaced with councils and the pa is to cede all control over the existing and therefore leave it to the new council and funding one of the things that I think, if I am not mistaken, I think it is PM Go Chok Tong who has said, why are the elected MP, uh, opposition MPs out of this schema of things? It's because much of the tapping of funds is from government funds. And therefore, I cannot see the connection. You tap government funds, therefore, why can't you be more inclusive of elected opposition MPs? I cannot see that connection. So we, that's, I think, something we have to dive into deeper uh, etc so i'm just sharing the papers that we have done before and i will conclude going back to the very first slide structural reforms i think are very important and are how we connect with the media and the media connects on all this form of analysis with the academy academia is going to be the next phase and more work with all the political parties, all, including ruling party, will be how Marwa would like to work. We have always done it that way, and we will continue to carry on in that way because that is the only way. Talk to people, talk to media, and talk to all political parties. And so I will end on this last slide, which I thought was fun, but also some parts are poignant. Thank you. Thank you, Brema. A lot of... Uh stuff there for us to chew on for a long time, especially for a political party like Red Dot United. So there are many ways that our electoral system could be done, right? And probably we have been stuck with one way for the last 60, 50, 60 years. So uh, perhaps it's time to reimagine how our electoral system could be, right? So uh, I think there's a lot for us to go back think on. Uh, we may even come out with a proposal or a position paper uh, later, but thanks so much. There, there is really a lot of meat in what you presented. And I must apologize, you are indeed the third speaker. Terry was supposed to go uh, <laughs> after you. Um, yeah, so, well, Terry will, Terry will go next. Uh, Terry is my friend. I've known him for a, for a, a long time, uh, and uh, uh, he, I think, TOC is the only 
news out the author the only alternative news outlet which put boots on the ground during the last GE. So I think it's very important for us to hear uh, the TOC's experience in contesting. Uh, I'm sorry, the TOC's experience in covering the the elections, not just the 2020 elections. The TOC has covered several elections, right? So what's their experience and what are the challenges that the alternative media faces? Terry, over to you. My audio. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, let me see. Let me see whether does it work. Is the screen to me? No. Yes. Can I? The screen is on you. Oh, is it? Is it? Oh, I can't see it though. Know. Uh, okay. So, I actually don't have a script. Uh, in fact, I, I'm going to seek all my time to like Bama and Howard. Uh, but 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 I think my, um, by and large, I think what's pertaining here is that for the difficulty actually running an independent media in Singapore is that the government doesn't recognize uh, the assistance, your assistance. They, they would only recognize you when it's about uh, having you to sign regulations to, to, to try and uh, tighten up uh, your source of income, your source of funding, uh, or try to, uh, try to um, make your operation hard. But when it comes to like facilitating your work, such as uh, uh, allowing to have a a uh, media pass, for example, uh, they will say all sorts of reasons that oh, uh, there's no need for media pass. You can actually go about your stuff doing it. But in reality, it doesn't work that way. Uh, for example, like uh, for COVID, for example, uh, all the all the press conference were not invited uh, or given the access uh, to view via video conference. Uh, similarly, in in the general election, uh, we are not being given access to the nomination center. Uh, neither are we allowed to go in the polling centers to report uh, independently on what transpired. Uh, which is why uh, we, although we have catered for volunteers to 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 be there at the nomination center, polling centers, we eventually we can't because in in this general election. Uh, Further restrictions were put in place uh, to prevent public from uh, from gathering, cl uh, clustering around the nomination center and polling centers, and making it even worse that my volunteers can't even actually go near the uh, the place, uh, and and only media were actually allowed to do so. Um, let me see what point else. Um, so so basically, the whole strategy of the uh, People's Action Party government is to delegitimize the media outlets, and say, uh, the independent media outlets. Uh, I would say for TOC, TRSG, uh, and, and other small platforms that are out there. Uh, then uh, allowing the media public to have this perception that uh, these are outlets that you don't really have to uh, bother about uh, or put much weight to what they actually say. Um, and I think most, uh, one point that I think has to be really highlighted is really about the independence of ELD uh, from, from the perspective of media. Uh, media outlet. Because we, we do, uh, because of our, as what Ravi puts it, we have foots on the ground, uh, as in feet on the ground, and we do receive a lot of feedback in terms of uh, what kind of uh, transgression when it comes to the ruling party and also its supporters. We, we report on it. We feed back to the ELD, and ELD could could uh, could just simply ignore this, ignore this totally, not giving a single response, and and hopefully that uh, we will just uh, forget about the matter and just let the whole thing uh, uh, go all the way to the polling day. And I think it's actually uh, very wrong for that to happen, because imagine it's the other way around when uh, if a the media outlet will report that the uh, uh, alternative party were to have certain violation. Particularly in the case of the posters, for example, ELD would go immediately down to the place and ask the uh, alternate party to, oh no, in fact, they don't go down to the place. They just simply make a call to the person in charge and ask them to go and retrofy within uh, what time. If they are unable to retrofy within that period of time, the, uh, the ELD will charge them by engaging contractors to remove the, uh, the, the posters. So, I think mean, in, in this case, this is actually just a small example of how ridiculously biased ELD is. And, and also, going back to the coverage, you know, 
uh, we were actually expecting to see more details in terms of how the uh, parties were spending, uh, particularly on the putting out of posters. As you, as uh, those who have volunteered in alternate parties before, you all would know that uh, all the posters and banners are put up by volunteers. Immediately after the nomination, what they do, they just run to the uh, the uh, the what's that lamp poles or is it the traffic traffic direction uh, sign and then put up their posters. Whereas, right for the People's Action Party, they have foreign workers actually putting up the the signs for them. And and I do recall that when I was checking the uh, the the receipts from the ruling party previously uh, in two zero one five. There was no such mention in terms of like, uh, uh, oh, uh, installation fees for the posters and manners. I was actually looking to, to have have this thing uh, scrutinize this point in this this general election. Uh, however, right, to my uh, to my surprise, is that this election, all this all this receipts right are being uh, 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 ELD basically tells the political parties, oh, you don't have to submit the receipts. Uh, the the uh, and I asked ELD. So, what if they actually they fabricate? Oh, no, no, I was saying fabricate. They misrep uh, misreport the the receipts. Then the response that I got was that oh, uh, the we would take action if someone were to complain. But the thing is, if 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 the receipt is not viewable by the public, then obviously there needs to be a whistleblower. And would the contractor who actually was paid for this thing go and whistleblow? Of course not. So, so it, it really, really baffles me. Like, why, why is ELD right, uh, reducing the level of transparency? And uh, whether is it on expenses or on, on the uh, so-called source of income? Uh, or like where, where this person is actually getting a fund from? Of course, for PAP, very easy. They say everything is paid for by PAP, the, the, the funds. Whereas for you can see from the alternate parties candidates, uh, some of them they would source donations from their friends, families. Uh, some would uh, basically spend little to none. Uh, I think there will be uh, I think of there were three candidates that reported no no expenses. I think about three. Then some less than one thousand. So, so I think on on as as I think on. Two, two, basically two, two agencies that I see a big problem with. One is ELD, the other is actually MCI. Yeah. I'll, I'll actually pass it to someone else <laughs> to cover the rest. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Uh, yeah, so uh, next on our panel is uh, Ms. Jeanette chong Aroldos, a lawyer. I think many of you would be very familiar with Jeanette. Um, she is a familiar face in our social political scene. Uh, and Jeanette, over to you. Okay, um, I'm here to talk about laws and uh, how it affects us as a society. So um, I think that uh, some of us in the uh, alternative camp have you know, been on the receiving end of uh, how, law, how certain laws are being enforced. But let me sort of like um, get to the basics. Um, I think we all agree that we need laws for order and for justice. So laws do serve uh, a common good and are beneficial to society because you ensure that there are consequences for wrongdoing, punishment for crime, personal safety and public order. And for Singapore, uh, you know, laws facilitate commerce, trade, and economic prosperity. And for, our, uh, for on a personal note, uh, laws facilitate personal happiness, peaceful living, uh, a, a place to raise our family and to enjoy our life. But then when, when, when do good things become bad? When do laws go wrong? Laws are meant to protect people and to serve the interests of our society. Laws go wrong when they serve ulterior motives and ulterior objectives. Laws go wrong when they serve the personal aims of certain powerful individuals or groups at the expense of greater citizenry. Laws go wrong when they serve the interest to protect and entrench those who are holding power 
instead of serving the good of people as a whole. Now, um, what is a hallmark of a thriving society? A hallmark of a thriving society is one where people are full of ideas, energy, imagination, and solutions for problems. And this only happens when people are given the space and freedom to ponder, to think, to discuss, and uh, you know, to, to engage. When we have a, 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 um, the, a thriving society is one where we can have a marketplace of differing ideas, opinions, different perspectives, and this is how innovation and, um, and uh, solutions and alternative solutions, uh, and, and that's how our society can respond imaginatively to change and challenges. On the other hand, a society which stifles thought, dulls the mind, will doom citizens to stagnation and regression. A clear sign of a failing society is one where people are always fearful, scared of trying new things, where the same solution is being employed when even when it no longer works. So where are we as a society? Are we flourishing or floundering? Now, truth and justice. How do we elicit truth and how do we get justice? There is a, um, a quote from the Bible. The first to present his case seems right until another comes forward to question him. So there are two sides to the story. Even the court system is adversarial. Two sides will argue a case. Because the best way to uncover, uncover truth is to hear both sides. The best way to find solutions is a debate. Now, when laws curb our freedom and space to think, when laws chill freedom of speech, curtail dissenting voices, society is detrimented, is harmed. When speaking truth to power becomes a hazard, when um, speaking out is like stepping into a minefield, when stakes are so high that um, entering politics or even expressing one's views you know, becomes um, problematic, then entering politics is almost forbidden. This is no good. So when, when laws and the enforcement of laws do more harm than good, we have a problem. Now, I, uh, I think there are some examples and some incidences that have been happened in the, in the past that do question our confidence, our confidence in, um, in how laws are being enforced. So I think uh, I take, for example, um, I compare, for example, uh, in 2016, uh, my good friend Teo So Lang was, um, she's only like five foot or maybe four feet 11. And uh, poor lady, she's, I think, 60 plus. She was um, hauled up for questioning. And then, uh, you know, six or seven uh, policemen followed her back to her house and seized her handphone, her laptop, uh, you know, uh, and it was all quite scary. And what she did was that she posted some, I think it was like four articles or shared four, I don't know. Well, she, she posted some, some stuff on her internet, on, the, on her Facebook page, on cooling off day in the Bukit Baitok by-elections. Uh, and then uh, recently, we also ha have um, a case of um, a new narrative, um, the, the election department complained that they published paid advertising, uh, which is supposed, you know, which is against the Parliamentary Elections Act. But the thing about these offences under the elections, um, under the um, Parliamentary Elections Act, 
is that they are classified as arrestable offences, which gives the police the power to come to your house and uh, to take away your devices. And, uh, and this is even before uh, the person is found guilty. Uh, in fact, for Solang's case, she was never charged. So, you know, um, these uh, offences under the Parliamentary Elections Act um, entitle, uh, you know, the, uh, the alleged offenders, entitle the police to raid the alleged, alleged offenders and to subject them to fairly humiliating treatment. And, uh, and, and, and they are, what they have done is, you know, is about expressing opinions, uh, which maybe they're not supposed to do so. Uh, and, uh, and this is what happened to them. Uh, now, in contrast, uh, we also have heard that our uh, Minister of Education, uh, in, in an effort to promote his candidacy at the recent GE, published a three-minute video in which a young boy in school uniform was featured and um, the ELD dutifully complained that the video infringed the elections, uh, the Parliamentary Elections Act. Uh, so um, our education minister, uh, Ong Yi Kang, uh, you know, immediately took down the, uh, the video and um, but of course, by that time, the video had already received 1,700 likes and 13,500 views before it was taken down. So, um, but unlike what happened to um, Teo Solang and New Narrative, um, nothing happened. <laughs> uh, the police confirmed that they had received a report but said that no further action will be taken. And um, that, that's it. So how do we account for the differences between how the police dealt with the Minister of Education's infringement compared with how the police dealt with Teo Solang's and new narratives infringements? Uh, and then, um, so also, um, there, there's this case of um, uh, a man uh, who is related to uh, the um, our prime minister. Uh, he shared uh, comments about the city-state's government saying that it's very litigious and has a pliant court system. Um, but he only, uh, you know, set his Facebook post to friends only. Um, but um, the Singapore's Attorney General decided to charge him with contempt of court. And uh, so six days after he made the post, he was charged. And um, as he was not in Singapore, um, the AGC went to the extent of hiring someone to serve court papers on him uh, when he, uh, after he was when he, in Harvard in, in the US, after he had just finished giving a lecture on economics. So um, the AGC went to great lengths to serve uh, the court papers on him. So, um, so these are, you know, examples, so these examples really, you know, give, give us food for thought. So I just want to um, go back to what I said earlier on is that, um, when laws, laws which are beneficial to us, uh, they go wrong when they are applied to serve the personal goals of certain powerful individuals, or they serve to make the powerful have more power. So it's our duty as citizens to vigilantly keep watch to see to it that the laws and the enforcement of laws actually serve the good of society. So I just... Um, you know, want to share these thoughts uh, in this um, webinar. And I just want to thank Red Dog for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to share some of my thoughts. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, the last person on our panel is uh, Mr. Howard Lee. 
Um, Howard is a PhD candidate with uh, Murdoch University. Howard, over to you, please. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, thanks for including me in this. Uh, always a pleasure to, to talk about media. This is kind of my thing now. Uh, and on the back of what Jeanette said, I think it'd be, it'd be quite tempting, of course, to talk about uh, media laws, right? Um, POFMA being one of those, and I think we saw what happened, like Jeanette said, what happened to new narrative. And I think all of us are fairly concerned, but uh, that is not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this probably be another discussion, very, very long discussions about the legitimacy of all these laws that are specifically used against the media. What I want to talk a little more about today uh, are some of the underlying issues about our media environment and what this means uh, in, a, in a general election in Singapore, in any kind of e election. Um, uh, with, with Terry, I think between us, we've covered like many hours of, of I think, well, personally for me, at least three different GEs. So, uh, fun experience, but also a lot of uh, painful stories to share. Uh, and I think after all that and, and basically stepping away from it and having a serious look about it, uh, I, I think that basically in, in order to have free and fair elections, I, I feel that there are two key things that the media needs. Uh, and they, they're going to sound very simplistic, but just let me walk, uh, walk through that. Right? Two things that we need. The first is to have access to information. And uh, the second is to be able to ask questions. And when I say able, I mean uh, both having the skills as well as there being no restrictions for journalists to actually ask questions. Um, now, it, it might sound pretty straightforward, of course, you, you need that, right? But if we would look at the current situation that we have, which is uh, what happened particularly during GE 2020, uh, what we see is actually a growing divide between mainstream media and online media. And they all relate to the kind of information that they have and the questions that they ask. So mainstream media gets all the information, uh, but doesn't ask the right questions. Online media, like what, like what Terry is doing, doesn't get the information, but they ask all the tough questions. Now, in, in this kind of situation, you might think, um, yeah, we have it down pat, right? So as long as someone is asking the question, someone has the information, it all fits together. And it's very tempting to say, no, let's, let, let's just let voters read between the lines, right? They'll be able to suss out the information. The situation that we have, however, uh, there are actually five problems that, that comes out from having this kind of dichotomy that we have between mainstream media and online media and the kind of information that they have. So the first problem is that voters are none the wiser about the issues. There's basically zero clarity because the information is just simply not flowing, right? Um, very, very simple one to ask, of course, is that, which is, just, which is what the Singapore Democratic Party highlighted. Exactly what is the government population plan? What is the target? To this day, we still don't know. There's a lot of hot air about it. We know it's, it's, it's some say 10 million, some say 7 million, but exactly what it is. Because if we know that information, then what it means to say is that we can basically judge political parties on what, the, what, what their proposals are. Is it going to work? If you want 10 million, if you want 7 million, then what are your plans for it? And that's how we make democratic decisions about the party we want to vote. The second problem that we have is that there's an increasing polarization of views, right? Um, there's distrust versus blind faith. Uh, for those who believed in the government, uh, without a doubt, then basically that is blind faith. But there's also a group of Singaporeans who, and I, I, I dare say it's a growing group, who are increasingly uh, less trusting of the government, uh, less trusting of government policy. And this is actually um, a, a problem uh, because it actually works against not just democracy, right, uh, but by the interests of all political parties. How, how is it possible for us to have a situation where people do not trust uh, what politicians are coming up with? Uh, it is really not a very healthy situation for us to be in. Third problem. There is a decreasing group of those who are in between, or what some people would like to call the middle ground, right? Between the those who really distrust the government and those who completely trust the government, and and th this group is generally uh, faced with an acceptance of the situation because if that's all the information that I have, then I might so well just live with it and just go along with it as it is, right? Just vote the most popular party or whoever someone else asked me to vote. So th that kind of uh, Lack of information is actually exacerbating the situation here. Fourth problem, um, there is a general distrust of the other media. And I'm, and I'm, ta I'm not talking about alternative online media. 
I'm talking about those who believe in, in the mainstream media having a distrust of online media and those who believe in online media having a distrust of the mainstream media. And uh, this is generally not good because then you do not appreciate the diversity of information that comes from both ends. The fifth and last problem, uh, and I think I won't be the only one who talk about this. There's actually no coming together of ideas and ideals to solve problems. Uh, I mentioned the, the population target, uh, that's one of them, right? And But it is actually quite crucial for us to come together, discuss stuff in a fair and even way with the most amount of information that we have, because that is ultimately the emblem of a functioning democracy. If people don't come together to solve ideas, you're just basically casting a vote for the most likable face. Um, and that really doesn't serve us well. Uh, the key thing I guess we have to ask is, how do we make democratic decisions based on distrust, frustration, resignation? Uh, is definitely not the way to go. And the current media situation that we have right now is really not helping it. So um, just off the top of my head, uh, I, I, I can think of four potential solutions, right? The first two are basically to address the issue of access to information. The next two is to address the media's ability to ask questions. Um, so the first one is uh, freedom. Is I, I, I keep harping about this uh, in public and elsewhere, is to basically have a Freedom of Information Act. I'm not going to talk too much about it, otherwise Ian will start rolling his eyes. Um, we, uh, uh, if, you, if you're really interested to know my views, uh, he, he, helped with, uh, he helped me publish this piece on academia.sg. Yeah. So feel free to check it out. But definitely uh, some laws to say that media should have access to information. That is really the first thing that we need to have. And I think Terry has pointed it out uh, quite, quite poignantly that basically, yeah, all media should have access to the information during an election before as well as after. Second part is to establish journalism as a common good. Now, what I mean by that is, uh, is to basically come a little bit closer to the model of uh, public service media that you find in quite a number of countries um, where the, uh, the state is able to fund journalism at arm's length. I, I know some of you would roll your eyes, right? We, the state already has control over the media. Why do you still want them to fund the media? Um, but I think that, that there are definitely a lot of details involved with this. Uh, the current situation is really not good, uh, where we have, um, where, where, where certain media, uh, I won't say which media, are, are quite clearly aligned to particular political ideologies. Now, you might say, let media declare their, their allegiances and let voters make the decision based on that. But I think we need to go a little bit beyond that. We have seen what's happening in the US, uh, and that is really, uh, in no particular way, a very healthy thing to, 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 to have. And we certainly don't want that in Singapore, right? Um, so what it does mean to say is that we, uh, we need to have a situation where the media is granted access regardless of the slant that they have or the kind of funding sources that they, that they have. Uh, it is basically to neutralize or depoliticize uh, the, the concept of media being political. Uh, media should not be political. It, it's, it's really about serving the public. And that's the first key thing that we really need to get down to. Third point uh, is to provide training for critical journalism uh, to basically, basically teach journalists how to ask questions. I see a lot of very frustrated people, some of my friends of mine who are complaining that why aren't the media asking the right questions? Uh, and yes, it is a problem. So I think media do need training on that. I think from Brema's time to Terry's time, we have seen quite a significant uh, a change in the, in the quality of uh, questions being asked. And I think we, we need to work a little bit more there. And the last point, fourth and last point is to establish standards for the industry. And this should be government, this should be governed not by the government, but by an independent body. I think there's a lot of room for us to work towards uh, independent media ombudsman, which we currently don't have. And I think we do need to see that coming out in order to have a more uh, positive and more active media environment. Now, all these proposals, they cannot be done by the government and um, they need everyone's involvement, uh, civil society, media outlets coming together to decide on what the standards are, uh, decide on what kind, of, uh, what kind of model they can work towards um, and what are the, what, what's the kind of information that they can expect 
coming from government. And I think uh, on that note, I think I'll just, hey, I'll just, I'll just end it there and uh, hand it back over to Ravi for yeah, whatever views they might have. Thank you, Howard. Um, thank you, everyone, for sharing your views. What Red Dot United hopes to do with this series of talks or dialogues or spotlights on certain issues that we hope to bring up from time to time is actually to hear from different individuals, from different experts, um, from stakeholders in particular sectors or field um, so that Singaporeans can learn and they can understand issues from different perspectives and form their own opinions uh, on issue on social and political issues which are often very important to them. So that's what we hope to do with our Red Dot Dialogues. Our Red Dot Dialogues are usually um, held with uh, individuals from uh, from different sectors um, and it's not representative of the position of RDU and then we also have other uh, another kind of uh, uh, another event that we have which we call the red dot spotlight the red dot spotlight will be RDU's positions or the RDU's policies on various issues so what we have today is a red dot dialogue the views expressed here by the different individuals and uh, are the views are their own views or the views of their organization they're not reflective of our views views right so we started this event a little bit late today we we're supposed to start at 8 p.m um, but because of technical difficulties we could only start at 8 15 p.m and i also decided to give the speakers a little bit of leeway to uh, over the time for them to, because it, was, it is a very important topic and they really needed that time to explain what they were saying right so we, we are going to going to go a little bit over time there are some questions which have come our way uh, the panelists can decide to answer the questions or not um, and uh, uh, yeah so uh, I'm not sure if we can answer all the questions but uh, uh, we will try to try to pick up as many as we can, right? Considering the time limit that we have. One question that came to me was, uh, do you view the vote counting as one of the most important parts of electoral process? In terms of electoral integrity, how would you rate Singapore's GE in this area? And how could it be improved? Did you get that question? Does anyone have a view on this? Okay, I, I um, so I'm going to feedback from from the media perspective again. So I was uh, because we were not given the media credential, so therefore we we gave up covering the polling day. What what we did was to volunteer as a counting agent. So I I volunteered for SDP. So I think mean, what is uh, lacking, I would say, right, is that you know why why can't the voting process be live like live stream? It, people could actually uh in, because the thing is for some of the political parties, right, they do not have enough volunteers to be there, uh, ensuring that uh, everything is proper and due. If right, is in fact, uh, if in fact the voting slip is anonymous, meaning no one could know who is it. Also, what's uh, what's stopping the the ELD from live streaming the whole counting process, where people can know uh, would know that no votes are being like smuggled in. Uh, there's no mixing of votes. You can you can hear properly like the counting agent counting. Okay, how much is the vote for this person, this candidate? How much is the vote for that candidate? And I'm, and I believe Ian can could actually um, come in and say that how what's the practice in overseas where where like they, they do that and in fact the other thing that we see uh, that's I would say problematic is that there's no need for the votes to be uh, transported from the polling station to the counting station in the uh, in in the first place because that is unnecessary uh, labor uh, if 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 you actually have the votes counted at the polling station, imagine the kind of manpower you could actually save. 
uh, and also the vo volunteers from uh, the various political parties could could uh, would not have to actually relocate the volunteers from the polling stations to the counting stations. That, that's my view on that. Mm. Um, yeah, so uh, let me just add on. I mean, uh, so far in Singapore, we've not, uh, fortunately, not had the experience of um, uh, fraudulent votes. Uh, but I think to have um, extra trans transparency would be helpful. It's uh, added, um, I guess, gives people added safe, uh, peace of mind. Uh, so, for example, uh, what comes to mind, I, I think what Terry was referring to is uh, TOC some years back uh, ran uh, a piece that uh, had uh, vote counting in Taiwan. Uh, and what's interesting about their process is the votes are counted uh, where, where they're cast, right? Uh, but they are open. Uh, so basically there's, there's, the, there's, the, um, there's the polling station, which is often in a uh, you know, common community space. Uh, and then after voting ends, uh, the electoral officers will then, um, in front of everybody, so it has to be, uh, open the, the, uh, the ballot box. And then from there, uh, they will take out each ballot and then they will read out who it was cast for. And then there's a board behind them where, where it's marked so everyone can see who, you know, who gets how many marks and all that. Um, and, uh, they, and, then for, and then because they show everyone the ballot, so everyone looks to see, okay, if the marking on the ballot is uh, accurate, if, it, if they want to contest it, uh, they can do so on the spot. Right, and then every can, one can see what it is. So that that's that's another approach. Um, uh, still, others are to allow independent uh, election monitors to to go in and, and look at the counting, um, and and to see if there are any irregularities. So that there are, there are various numbers of uh, approaches that can be done. So uh, in Singapore, I think right now uh, we we haven't had any problems. Uh, but the question uh, for us is always, you know, how can we make the system better? Can we improve on the system? So that's something to, that's worth thinking about. Lah. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, if I may, just a short intervention here. I've been a counting agent and uh, I have never found any problem with the systemic approaches. But I take Terry's point. Uh, a lot of time and human resources go into the transportation and maybe it's good to look at alternative systems. But I think what is more important is that um, <clears throat> the whole training approach of counting agents could be easily centralized. ELD can do it. And then the political parties can add, do their added stuff if they so wish. I find that the whole process of training to become a counting agent is so cramped up and political parties themselves have to find resources. And the citizens now, I, I hope more and more citizens, because it can be a very neutral approach that you take on to just provide service to the whole electoral system. So I, I think it's good to study more, but I, I, <clears throat> I think that uh, training should be improved and more of us should not think about it so hard, whether to be a counting agent or Thank a polling you. agent. Thank you. So, on, on that part, you know, other than, other than say, um, helping the alternative parties to resolve the issue about the volunteers, the other thing is also to address the fears of the voters in terms of like, oh, am, is my vote sacred? Because if they were to actually witness the whole process, they will, will realize that there's no way, there's no way that 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 uh, that the incumbent were to able to or take an independent vote and then um, uh, uh, match it with the their, their records to, to determine who actually voted for what. You will realize that the whole process in which after which uh, the polling booth is closed and transported to the counting station and before it's being sealed up in order for the subsequent uh, uh, dis uh, disposal six months later. This whole process, there's no time, uh, there's no way, nor there's time to, to really fiddle with the, the votes. There's simply too many. Uh, even if you're someone who they want to find out who you voted for. So with that, actually, it will inculcate more trust in the secrecy, in the secrecy of the vote. Mm. That's what I think. Mean. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just uh, add something. Yes, sure. Yeah. Thanks. So I think uh, the idea of uh, being an accounting agent and all that is good. I mean, it's, it's a good one because um, 
it's it's part of our civic duty, right, to be active and so to be part of the political process um, is probably something that's good for everyone to try to get uh, more engagement in. Okay, so the next question is an interesting one. Um, do you believe that that a fair playing field is ever possible? Isn't it natural for a ruling party to advantage itself if possible? Which government would help the opposition displace itself? Okay, I will attempt. All right. Okay. I I think they, there's a there's a problem with the question itself because if we believe in free and fair elections as a citizen's right. Whoever the party is, they have to make sure that it happens. If we do not have the systems and structures in place to make that happen, it is for us to keep asking, even in a highly restricted society like ours. So tying up a little, so I, I just want to stretch it to include what Howard was saying about, you know, the standards and all the rest. I think the empowerment of our citizen is the evolutionary path that we are on. Uh, I hope we will gain strength, even us as a civil society, we need to become stronger. All of us need to become stronger rather than just become renters and rave about something. What's the next action? Let's do it and let's build up our Singapore to the, a, a better structure to, for, for the next law. Eh? So I think that must be the commitment. So to answer this question, any party, uh, even within a home background or a work background, whoever has the power would normally want to entrench and embed that power even more. But who calls out on those procedures? Uh, a sibling that's angry, a colleague that's angry, and us as citizens, that is not the system. So, so no point saying, oh, surely they would do it. I think that is already an answer in itself. I think it has to come back to us. And right now, our structural systems can add weight to, to the whole process of having it a little bit loaded, especially through the GRC scheme through the campaigning period, which uh, some of us have already talked about, through the numerous restrictions, not letting social media that Terry and Howard have talked about, and us becoming more critical. I talked right at the beginning about instancy of information. We have to develop our own analysis that, is that right? Is that true? Do I care? What is more important? So we, our own growth, we have to do a lot more of work. It's easy to talk, but there's a lot more work that all of us have to do for ourselves and civil society has to become more, a lot more. That's all I can say. And Thank it you. is tough. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. We'll, we'll, try to, we'll try to get two more questions. And does, does anyone else have a view on yeah. that? Yeah, I, I have something uh, quickly to say about that. I think in Singapore, one of the things that happens is uh, that we sometimes look at the uh, uh, parking power and um, take that to mean that is, it is the same as the state. Uh, it is not, right? As, as citizens, um, uh, we, we form the state, the institutions that we have, the national institutions that we have, they, they are the state. And uh, they are supposed to be above any particular political party, regardless of uh, who, is, uh, who is in office. So uh, that means to say that there is, or at least as citizens, I mean, to, to reinforce very much point, as citizens, um, we should hold our national uh, institutions uh, to account because what they should be doing is to ensure that no particular political party is trying to uh, use the system uh, to their unfair advantage. Yes, they, I mean, they will try, but this is the point of uh, having oversight. I mean, political parties ultimately, uh, whether they are in office or not, uh, they are people who we've delegated, uh, especially for those who've been elected, we get, People, uh, they are organizations, individuals who citizens have delegated to act on their behalf. So um, they should not go beyond that mandate and uh, you know, try to, um, um, uh, to, to work the, the broader system. It happens. This is where oversight is, is key. Uh, this is where uh, 
participation, citizen participation is quite key. And I would also add that, I mean, when you think about voting people in office, um, sometimes it's, uh, we like to think about, well, it's voting who you like to lead, who you like to represent you. But in addition to that, um, it's also who you would like to oversee, who you would like to uh, engage in debate with. Okay, I'll leave it there. Uh, sorry, just one last point on that. Sorry, Ravi. I think knowing our constitution and the limitations of the constitution to the changing dynamics of a country, all countries are going through this. So we cannot also hold the constitution like sacrosanct. Uh, it, uh, it has to adjust to changing dynamics. But I think knowing our constitution, and I'm discovering it more and more, and many of us are literate. That's the thing about us in Singapore. But, and everything is online. <laughs> so, okay. sorry. Yeah, okay, uh, sorry. Right. The next question, uh, most democracies suffer similar issues. For example, redrawing election boundaries parties in power refusing to fund opposition programs. Why are free and fair elections a big issue or talking point for Singapore? <laughs> uh, I can I can take a step at that too if you want. I, think uh, um, I mean, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. Yes, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, there's a temptation for those in power to use everything they can uh, to their advantage. This is just what comes with power, it's very natural. Um, which is also why um, this part about being um, active citizens, this part about pursuing improvements to the system, demanding more, uh, that's an ongoing process, it doesn't end. It's not one that you say, okay, well, uh, if we achieve this at this date, uh, that's it, and we can all go home, it's not. Um, one of the things about democracy uh, that people sometimes forget uh, because we talk about delegation and all that is that there has to be active participation. There has to be uh, sufficient information. Citizens have to take a role. Um, they have to be active, right? Uh, and if you see um, that attention, you see that active, uh, activeness uh, to others, uh, especially too much, right? Uh, what will happen will be erosions to the system. So uh, it's natural that all um, democracies will talk about these issues uh, and debate over them uh, incessantly. Yeah, I just would like to add on uh, any, anyone else. I think we just to reiterate uh, what Jeanette raised, uh, the legislation issue. I think all that is important. It's part of all the nuts and bolts to why we have to safeguard free and fair elections as a systemic approach. And it must be imbued into all of us because media can change the approach. Legislation can can tweak it and and therefore if we do not comprehend what free and fair elections how crucial it is and how important the vote is i i because vote voting is mandatory in singapore sometimes when it is mandatory it becomes an exercise the engagement gets weak but when i make a determined choice to make sure i go and vote you are asserting on your own power i think that's important but just on a very minuscule scale to answer that question, I think Ian raised and Terry to the question on financial resources and all the MPs and the candidates who, who uh, sorry, all the candidates who stood for GI 2020, the numbers went up. They went up on social media in detail. And also there was a link. I think looking at that, surely anyone would be like, hey, how come uh, that how come must surface? That is so much money over there. And how is it that over here, somebody who's having not such a great job is dipping into the pockets of party that doesn't have that much. That alone must trigger something to say why we have to safeguard and ensure that we have free and fair election. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, the last question, um, can opposition, by Isabel Liu, she asked, can opposition suggest to voters they will form the government and first thing they, they do is to cut minister's pay? Uh, well, I actually wrote to you to say I need. I would like to answer that because it's very much part of becoming a discerning citizen to assess promises of what candidates make. 
if you want to believe that candidate that that's the first thing they will do, then by all means, you have believed and you can go ahead and vote for the candidate or vote for the political party. If one were to believe everything case in point that US president uh, nominee, I mean, soon he will become a nominee when the election period begins, Trump is saying, and you believe that, you know, the coronavirus is not really a big problem, then by all means, go and vote. So campaign in themselves uh, can become structurally deficient in terms of content. So we have to know the information and that's a problem that Howard raised, the access to information, right? But we have to be at least alert. Do I really believe you? That kind of stuff. And do you have the prowess and the integrity as a candidate? Right. And if you follow that person, you have to follow that person. That is why I'm saying that under the GRC, you have uncontested people whom you have not really actually in any political election. You will see many people surfacing and some of them you do not know. So what's the worth of the party? Uh, all these are questions we have to ask and maybe we have to develop a criteria approach to help citizens. Maybe that's the next step. Oh, others, sorry, I had I, I talking too much. Pardon me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. um, Howard, go ahead. I, know, I, I just wanted to add to the point that um, holding, I mean, voting parties based on the promises is one thing, uh, but after the election, after the dust has settled, right, holding them to the word is probably is probably the next more, the next critical thing. Um, and having the, the information, so any party might say, okay, if, I, if you vote me into power, I will I will cut salaries. I'll come in and salaries. Uh, and throughout all that, you have to hold them to account until the next term whether they have done it. And we are just only looking at one point of ministerial salaries, but a whole bunch of other things that uh, that parties have promised. Uh, and we need to hold the parties to account. And if all of us, oh sorry, I would say all of us, if the majority of us voted for the PAP then we should do the same. We should basically hold them to account for the promises. Mm -hmm. What have they uh, promised us during the elections? For instance, how many millions, millions of jobs have they actually produced there? Where are the jobs coming from? So if we're able to do that, then yes, then the elections would mean something in that sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, right. so, yeah, yes, please. No, so I, I'd agree with Howard. I mean, this goes to the point about when you vote for somebody, um, it's about who you want to oversee. So uh, in um, Isabel Liu's question, uh, essentially she's asking for a certain platform. Well, if you're interested in that kind of platform, uh, what you should do is to go and engage uh, political parties on it and see if they will take it on. For those who will take it on uh, after they get into office, um, you know, keep keep on, keep on their case. Uh, whether this is uh, on media, getting your friends to go on uh, media to uh, social media or, or mainstream media to write things. Uh, this means uh, you know calling up uh, your representative. Uh, it means uh, you know writing to the to the parties in question. And this is uh, why I mean to say that uh, democracy, for it to have its full effect, requires uh, active participation. And it's it's not easy. It's tiring. Uh, but that's how you make it work. Thank you, Ian. For uh, Red Dot United, we are, we, are, we, are, we are a smaller political party. In the last election, we fielded five candidates, so we were in no position to form the government. I think even the biggest political, uh, opposition political party, the Workers' Party, they fielded about 30 candidates, I think. They, they were also not in a position to, feel, to, to form the next government. So um it's it's it will be a it will be a very challenging thing you know in, in the in kind of environment that we are in for any political party to field 90 plus candidates to contest in an election you know it'll be it, it will be very very challenging so well, i just need more than half and then win, win that more than half already, yeah. yes no, yeah. but, but, but the issue here is, you see, it's, it's actually very complicated and com uh, compared to like what some sing, uh, some voters would like to see. It, it, it goes back to what uh, you were asking just now about whether or not a fair playing field is important to ensure. Because you know, to many voters, a fair playing field is not the top priority of their mind when it comes to actually voting. It will be like whether my living standard will be maintained 
would there are uh, my uh, there will be employment for me and my kids. So so for for going and going linking up with the ministerial pay. A, a party can say that oh I will go in and then we'll uh, we'll reduce the ministerial pay. But what about the other issues that the person and and my understanding of PAP they would they would actually uh, use this issue and distract from the issues that they are facing like or they are handling of COVID. They are they are the reliance on foreign labor. They are bringing in on the foreign PMEs. So rather than them being so called distracted by the minister pay, there are more important pertinent things that that should be focused on. And and true enough, if you look at it, our workers party has never really like go and dabble into this. Uh, it, it, there are other issues that voters are more concerned with, and instead of it, and the worst thing it could happen is that PAP would turn to you say, "Oh, are you going to are you going to go there with this sort of pay, and what kind of people are going to bring in?" And you go into a, a, another kind of like weird kind of debate with the establishment. So this is not something that the 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 alternative party should should go into. Not to mention. As Ravi rightfully pointed out, now, a lot of the parties are not big enough to say that oh, we're going to actually take over the government, and that would signify that you would actually have to have a joint alliance with other parties, and joint alliance to me scares the voters. Oh, are you going to have a messy coalition to take over the government? And that's another <laughs> thing by itself. Yeah, that's my. Yeah. So, uh, but I think that we still need to uh, call. Uh, we still need to call the uh, the high ministerial salaries you know, into question. I think that's something that we did in, in our last uh, dialogue, in the last dialogue that we had. You know, because why why do we the political appointees that that we have, the high ministerial salaries that that they draw? I think one of you, I think it was Brema, who brought up about the, about the mayors, right? And they were sworn in, I think, yesterday. Um, every one of our political point is they will be millionaires or multi-millionaires by the time they leave office you know so um, so these are important questions to raise so we I, I mean for me personally I would like to thank Isabel Liu for bringing this question up and it is tied to free and fair election right so uh, yeah so with that I would like to ask if you have any parting shots, Brema, Howard, Jeanette, Ian, and Terry? Because of what you said, Ravi, and actually I was already winding down. I, I think it is true, the multimillionaire and the millionaire salary and all, sometimes we, we it's fair, we got to talk about it. That's my personal view and all that we have to talk about it. But it, it takes center stage that other stuff gets buried. I, I think we have to talk about it, but it keeps becoming like the big gong that we keep clanging on it all the time. Huh? And then it it puts other things in. Uh, 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 so I think we talk about it, but we need the balance. But I just want to touch also on what Terry said we are so afraid because we have had one ruling party for the longest time that a coalition frightens us. And during the election campaign, there were paid, there were I think on social media like it's New has New Zealand collapsed. But it also comes from the background of having a approach to plurality and approach to democracy. And and so I think all of us have said the same thing here. Like when you have alternative views, is that person hey, you're not not thinking like me you are you are out uh, the circle only belongs to all of us who think alike i think these are all coping skills and coping mechanisms we are building ourselves up to and um, maybe that's another discussion on another day i think all these are the tools we need yeah yeah are they shots um, so I, I have uh, just two things to add. I think one one of the issues in, in Singapore when we talk about um, free and fair elections, it has to come down to how citizens debate with each other. Um, it's something we are, you know, working on in Singapore, but we can definitely get better. Uh, so I mean, for instance, we uh, can do better at say debating the issues rather than attacking persons. Uh, because ultimately, you know, that's what really matters when, when, when it's in office, right? It's the kind of issues that, that are up there that will affect our daily lives. Uh, of course, there'll, stop, there'll be some personal issues that matter, but I think most, most of them don't. Um, and so to sort of 
agree, learn to agree to disagree and to sort of keep the conversation going is one thing that, that's key. Um, another is sometimes uh, I think we have a tendency to um, make heroes um, out of uh, uh, politicians, right? To think that they will solve all our problems, but they're not. I mean, they're there to do a job, uh, and it's important to recognize what uh, what that job is and what to hold them to account for, rather than to sort of believe that they will be the be all and end all uh, of uh, our, our problems, right? But they're not. They're, they're there, and they need to be supervised by citizens, and that, that's something that I think um, it's good for Singaporeans to remind ourselves of. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, just yeah, I just thought I'll end by by saying, I mean, the whole idea of uh, having free and fair elections, uh, and and bouncing off what Ian has said as well, uh, we we think that sometimes it's about it's about changing the government, right, or getting the government to do something. Uh, but ultimately, if we want free and fair elections, it's about us. It's about mm -hmm. us going out to get the right information. It's about uh, us working together, be it with media, with lawyers, with academia. Hopefully, it's academia, you know? um, and and basically have uh, keep thinking that it is it's not just about um, who who has everyone has a right right to 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 build up Singapore, and it's sometimes it's just aspirations that that are, or negative aspirations coming from the government about who is the loyal Singaporean, who is doing the right thing, who is doing the wrong thing. I think we have to break that mindset, and it. It helps only when all of us are open to alternative ideas, are open not just alternative parties, right? Or alternative ideas uh, about how is it that we can build Singapore. And yeah, definitely we need everyone to chip in for that. Thank you, Howard. Terry, parting shots. Parting shots. Uh, Eric, I, I, I think just two, two, two points. One is uh, what Howard mentioned in, in terms of the public service media. Like Singapore should have something like C-SPAN where the government pays for pays for coverage and and the intimate media could actually just step from that because <laughs> after all you know china Suisse asia is, is owned by media corp media corp is owned by what Tomasic. Tomasic is owned by what the singapore government so, so in a way the, it's actually public public funded media outlets however right it, it disguises itself under the guise of a public uh private entity and whenever we have to use their property and we have to pay them. There's something is wrong here. The other thing is, in terms of how the election is conducted, too little time for this course. Nine days, what kind of discussion can we have? Uh, which goes back to what Bremer mentioned, what Ian mentioned. In terms of, there, there's so much topics that he, be, be discussed. And, and, and it's too little time to understand, to get to know the candidates, uh, who they are. And, and it's really... Uh, like someone like Dr. Jamin Slim is someone really rare you can actually just shine out of nowhere through the live debate. And live debate is another thing that, that we should be looking at. And not to mention that there's no set timing in terms of when the elections is called. You know, based on TOC sources, right, uh, based on our own estimate, the election timing has been changed at least five times. They, they, they wanted to hold the election in 2019, early 2019, but they put, keep putting off in March, in June, then in September, November, then March this year, uh, then put off to April, and we, we, we have concrete proof that they wanted to actually have it in May, June. But because of the COVID, they actually pushed it even back. So you see, the other thing, how can the citizens be ready to, to read out on the issues or even the political party to get ready when you keep changing this thing? And and there, we, we don't even talk about the whole system. We just based on the timing itself makes it so unfair. And and there's something that the, the citizens have to actually demand that uh, no such nonsense. We we have to actually change the system in order to be fair for for even the voters. Like how many there were two hundred thousand voters stuck outside, and they were unable to vote. They wanted to come back to vote, but because of COVID, they were unable to vote, and there was no arrangement made to allow them to vote. And this is something that people have to really think about. It. Yeah, yeah. So I like Howard, yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Jeanette. Yeah, okay. So um, I think that uh, one of one question you had was that, oh, you know, uh, what's wrong, uh, you know, those who, who stay, who are in power will definitely want to stay in power. And, if it, and why would we expect them to help, um, you know, others uh, you know, who is against their interests? So this, this, this thing about tolerating self-interest, 
you know, we have been so long in a regime where uh, we have a ruling party that, that it holds a super majority. And, uh, but I think that we need to uh, develop a sense of outrage with that when, when we see signs that those in power are trying to do things which, uh, you know, serve themselves, okay, uh, we should feel a sense of outrage. And, uh, and, and one immediate and very, um, you know, um, step that, can, that uh, Singaporeans can take is to support independent media. Because this power play is also being uh, played out, uh, you know, in the um, mainstream media versus the independent and the, you know, minority, whatever, um, alternative voices. So, um, uh, you know, all these, there are many uh, uh, arenas where this um, power struggle or rather this persecution of dissenting voices are being uh, played out, okay? So I'm just saying that one immediate, uh, you know, way is to support independent media. And um, the other thing is that, um, you know, talking about free and fair elections, uh, you know, the fact that the ruling party, you know, is the one who decides when to hold the, 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 the elections, to uh, when to release the boundaries, you know, all these things, you know, uh, are in the hands of the ruling party. Uh, and I think one, uh, you know, commentator just now, I think Alfred Chang said, like, you know, can we um, have uh, uh, pa uh, different political parties uh, being in, in the election department? Well, that is certainly an ideal that we can, uh, where, where, where we have, you know, share, uh, because the elections department is, is, is also under the Prime Minister's office. So how can they be, uh, you know, arbitrate, uh, you know, judging, you know, what is fair and fair conduct if they themselves are serving uh, the, the, the Prime Minister's office. So, okay, I'm going to stop now. Thank you, Jeanette. So, uh, thanks to our viewers for watching us. I know it's been a long night, it's been more than two hours, but I think it's an important topic for us to be discussing. Um, as, we, as we go forward, let us think about what has been shared today. I think Marua has got a wealth of uh, information. Go check out their website. Um, all the individuals here, there are no strangers to many of us here. So I'm sure they'll be happy to take uh, questions from you um, if you have them. Right? Or you can write to us as well. Our email is red.united at gmail.com. Uh, in the coming days, we will be exploring youth employment and empowerment. Um, we are discussing this topic right now. We'll give you more information as and when we have them. But till then, thank you very much for joining us. This is Ravi Philamon from Red Dot United. Good night.